Good morning, good afternoon, good night, whatever it may be for you, whether you're uh, watching this uh, on a uh, video shot or whether you're driving in your car and listening, as uh, I know some do. Uh, welcome to Open Door, and I'm, I'm Bill Effler. And uh, today's another segment, a very, very different one. Uh, I want to set this up because it's a, it's a tender show today. We're talking about living through cancer living through cancer. And uh, I'm going to be introducing you to a, a dear friend of mine. Uh, uh, she and I, we hang out at a local eatery and we do prophetic ping pong. That is to say, we talk <laughs> about what do we, uh, how do we see God working in our lives? So I um, uh, want to introduce to you uh, Amy Pilgrim and Amy's with me here today. And Amy, thanks for hanging out with me for a little bit of time here. It's my pleasure to be here today. Amen. And so uh, uh, Amy and I have known each other. I was just thinking about this last night. I think it's about 10 years now. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I was introduced to her by a former student of mine. And he said, I need you to meet the female version of Bill Effler. <laughs> and so remember Stephen saying yeah. that? Yes. And so that's what started our, our relationship. And uh, she and I run in similar circles that really uh, value the unexplainable presence of God. And uh, we call it the ministry, you know, of, of the prophetic. Uh, Amy is very involved in our home church in downtown Chattanooga, Redemption to the Nations, which is uh, pastored by Kevin and Devin Wallace, a very dynamic ministry down there. So, um, Amy, let's begin this morning this way. Um, when people hear the word cancer, uh, all different types of images come to mind. Uh, my own family has had to deal with cancer. Uh, Kristen has had numerous uh, facial cancer surgeries. Uh, our son battled cancer, and he's been cancer-free now for uh, about nine years, so which we're really thankful for. His, his story was, was very, very dangerous. But uh, let me ask you this first question, and that is, when you first heard, now almost two years ago, the word cancer, that the doctor said, uh, you have cancer, what came into your mind? Well, to be real honest with you, right before a couple, probably about six months before it happened, the Lord had um, spoken to me at, one time at prayer, and he told me that I was about to see him in a way that I had never seen him before. And of course, I thought, you know, he's going to rapture me, but um, he said, whatever you do, don't be afraid. And so I'll, I'll never forget laying down and having the scan done and the doctor coming and saying, this is not looking good. He said, we, we, you have two. He said, no, you don't have just one cancer. You have two stage four cancers. You have stage four colon and stage four liver. And immediately, as soon as he said that to me, honestly, I thought, I will not fear. This is what the Lord was warning me about. So immediately, I felt like a protective shield came over me. And to be real honest and transparent with you, I've never been afraid. Not one time have I been afraid in this journey because I remember him saying, do not be afraid. You'll see me in a way you've never seen me. And so I held on to those words. So when the doctor told me after I'd come out of um, the scan and stuff that this is what we're looking at, and I just he said, we'll go up and tell your family. And I just said, you know what, doctor, you're not going to do that. I said, I need to talk to another doctor, and his name is Dr. Mm -hmm. Rafa, mm -hmm. and he will tell me. And so you're not going to tell my family anything. I said, I will do that on my own as I pray about it. Wheel me back up to my room. And I, and, and I remember that first night I didn't tell anybody. I just prayed about it all night long. But honestly, I never was afraid. And I thank God the reason that I wasn't afraid is because he already had given me that word of do not be afraid, and, and I just held on to that. You know, fear is a very paralyzing uh, emotion. It's it's very common, and I think some of the listeners have heard the the uh, the teaching that fear is false evidence appearing real, and it just really uh, comes over us. So, generally speaking, over the last two years, can you describe your life and uh, what's life been like living with cancer? Yeah, it's been it's been an adventure. It really has. Uh, I don't I don't even dread it because it's been bittersweet. And we, the reason being is cancer is very real. I do, you know, have a lot of pain and, you know, I, I do go through chemo treatments and chemo is terrible for the body. Mm -hmm. um, I do, you know, struggle with neuropathy. 
Uh, I've lost my hair. I'm right in the middle of it growing back now. So I don't want to pretend that those things aren't happening because mm-hmm. they're very real. Mm-hmm. There's times mm-hmm. I can't get out of the bed. There's times I can't taste my food. I don't feel like eating. Uh, I lost a lot of weight at the beginning. I've gained it back now. Um, but I don't. I don't try to focus on those things because I can tell you at every angle, at every corner, at every milestone, I have seen God's hand in my life. And so I, when people ask me that, how's it been that you've been living with cancer this long? and how? I just feel like it's an opportunity. Mm-hmm. And the opportunity lies in watching God work in my life so closely. It's just amazing, mm-hmm. and I and I'm not saying that there haven't been times that I'm wondering why am I still going through this, or you know, there's times I want to, I don't like the journey so much because I don't feel well, and and I just cry out to God and say, you know, enough is enough. When is when is my healing coming? But but I don't want to give too much power to that because every time at every angle I have seen His fingerprints in my life, and it's not where people and, and I just want to say this to the listeners. A lot of the times when you go through turmoil and go through things that are rough and tough, they're very real. But we're always looking for smudges. This is what's wrong. This is what didn't go wrong. Why didn't God heal me? All that. But I look for his fingerprint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I look, I can see his fingerprints. And I know that he's working in my life and I trust him. What would be one example of a, you use the word fingerprint, uh, that is to say, uh, a marker uh, that this has got to be a, uh, respectfully. This is a God thing. Uh, can you give us just one example of of, of that? Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the one of the examples that comes to my mind really quick is that when the doctors told me they said they said, Amy, you know your situation is pretty bad. We it's not curable, but we're going to try to keep you comfortable. But eh, it's not looking <laughs> good for you. <laughs> so basically, they're saying you're going to die, <laughs> and. The good thing about it is, I, and I just say to God, you know, if you're if you're ready for me, hey, you know what I mean? I'm ready. You know what I mean? But he wasn't ready for me yet. And, and I think that was, there's three things that happened in this journey. The first thing was, do not be afraid. You'll see me in a way you've never seen me. I held on to that. Six months later, I got another word in prayer. And he said, because you've obeyed my commandments, I've decided to let you live. So when he told me I was going to live, I knew I wasn't going to die. So to me, that was his fingerprint. The doctor's telling me, Amy... Get your things in order. Things aren't looking good. This chemo is not helping. Mm. You're getting worse. We don't know what else to do. We're going to keep you comfortable. And I and I look mm. for God's fingerprint, and His fingerprint to me was, I'm going to let you live, and you will not die. That's evidence that He is clearly in my life, presently in my life, and that He's watching everything that happens. And so I remember looking at the doctor and say, well, I'll talk to God about it and let you know. Mm-hmm. You know, um, how did the doctor respond? To that? <laughs> <laughs> At the beginning, the doctors were like, "Oh, this lady," but now they're used to me. Um, but he nobody just, ever gets used to you, Amy. <laughs> so. He just looked at me and he said, "I looked at him and said, well, you know, you don't have the final say. God does. So thank you for doing what you do, but I'm going to talk to God about it and I'll let you know what He says." And he just looked at me and said, "Okay," just like I was an alien, you know. Okay. I'd like to pause here for a second. Um, so we have a diagnosis, and and those diagnoses are uh, they're verbal, but they're also written. Yes. And uh, uh, we were taught uh, many years ago that when we, particularly when we have something as serious as cancer, uh, to go to God in, in prayer and ask that those things that have been spoken and written be canceled. Now I'm not talking about a blab it and grab it and you know, every, we're going to, you know, live forever and never in, in la-la land. I'm not saying that. That would be ridiculous. Um, but I, like Amy, could tell you uh, of several situations where uh, where we have prayed that that those things that have been spoken and those things that have been written would be wiped away, and the doctors have have no explanation. I uh, Our own son, early on— uh, his heart was shutting down. He was less than 24 hours uh, old, and we had a group of people pray for him. And when his heart self-corrected, the Come doctor, on. who is from South Africa, uh, he said, uh, well, we call this a marvel, mm-hmm. a marvel. And I said, well, you call it a marvel. I spell that M-I-R-A-C-L-E. And he says, and I know how you bishops think. 
Yeah. So uh, I want to encourage the the listeners that it's responsible. God heals through uh, the miraculous. He also heals through medicine. Sometimes He uses both. That's clearly the case with 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 our with our son. So uh, I know that that you're a beach girl. Yes. And and you and Randall have just gotten back from a vacation in the beach, so you were able to enjoy the beach. Uh, I saw your pictures on, on Facebook. Looked like you had a great time. Right. So. Um, so I'd like to ask this question. What is a, a day in the life of Amy Pilgrim? What uh, You've said that sometimes there's some good days and some not so good days. But what is, a, what is a regular day like for you now? Well, it just depends. You know, there's I've got everything to where we've got it down to an art now. Like there's a week that I take chemo. That's a very different week from the week after chemo. Mm-hmm. And so it just depends. We plan everything around those treatments. Uh, but just a typical day would be a day full of fatigue, um, no appetite, uh, very weak, um, just um, wanting to rest a lot, um, very thirsty, but don't want to really drink. You don't taste anything. Um, you have to really set yourself like Flint to really, you know, exist in this world, in this present world right here, you know, and what I mean by that is like, my life is not like everybody's everyday life. You know what I mean? I have to, I have to fight all these symptoms. I have to fight saying, I'm not going to lay in this bed all day today. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to the post office and I'm going to go to Walmart and do those things, which to everybody else is just a normal thing. And Mm -hmm. to me, I have to prepare my body, prepare myself, prepare my heart, because Mm -hmm. a lot of the times, you know, you don't feel like doing, you, you could lay down and just really just drizzle, drizzle away. You know what I mean? So it's, it's a challenge. Basically Mm -hmm. there's a, there's a good word. It's a challenge every day to get up and face life in your, in your condition and know that God is good and that the day is going to bring good things. And you need to stay in that vein versus what's not happening for you. Because if you go there, it's a very dark place. I remember hearing many, many years ago from a uh, a preacher in Southern California that uh, a person's attitude, uh, determines their altitude. Yeah. And that is to say how we can rise above things. So, um, so when I think about living with cancer and I'm, again, I'm, this is not just, uh, I'm not speaking of somebody who does not know. I know, uh, personally for with my own family. Um, I think about a person's support structure. I think about their medical structure. Uh, I think about their emotional makeup, uh, and some people do not have a lot of any of that. So what have been some important things for you that have enabled you to live through and with cancer? Well, I actually, I'm very fortunate and I'm so thankful. Um, mm. My family, number one, my, my husband has been a champion. And, mm. and honest, to be real honest, I was really worried because when I first got diagnosed, he about lost his marbles. You know, he, <laughs> he, he really crashed down. And it mm-hmm. was just, and to see this big old six foot five, mm-hmm. you know, 285, big old guy just crumble down, it, it, was, it was hard for me to see. Um, but he has been the most amazing. And my two daughters, you know, that's my that's my family support. My husband and my two daughters have been amazing. They've been there through all of it. My my oldest daughter was at every treatment. She was at every, I mean, the first time I went to the emergency room, ever from the beginning to she was ever always been there, uh, supportive emotionally, um, making me eat, you know, taking me to all my appointments. She wouldn't miss anything. That helps a lot. You know, let me just stop right there and say this to the viewers that. You know, emotional support is very key in this thing because when you go to treatments and you see 28 other people laying there mm-hmm. getting chemo, a lot of them look mm-hmm. frail, they're throwing up, they're coughing, they're sick, some are flatlining right in front of you, and they're having to be taken to the emergency room. It's terrible to be there alone and be going through that. Uh, but it's all it's awesome when you have somebody who's beside you. Like my daughter comes and we play puzzles, we talk, we laugh, we listen to music, we sing. All those things make a big difference. Um, and so that's with my family. And I'd say I have a group of five women mm-hmm. that um, are intercessors for my life. And they have just rallied around me. And that's been great in prayer and in deeds. Mm-mm. 
Because let me tell you something. If somebody comes to you and tells you they're hungry, it's wonderful to pray for them, but I, it's better to buy them a burger and make sure they're <laughs> eating. Uh, don't just give them the, the wrong antidote, and that's for another time. But uh, it's just important to have that support. So I have these five women who rally around me. They pray for me. They they take me to do- they meet me at my every doctor appointment. They take turns doing that, you know. And um, and Roslyn and JD who have been at every appointment too. It's just that helps a lot. And and honestly, you know, I don't just want to be keep throwing the God thing around, but God. God is very real, and He's very alive today on this earth. And I am telling you, He has been a big part. I was telling you before we got started, you know, if it wasn't for God, I would be dead right now. Mm-hmm. I've, my doctors have told me on several occasions, Amy, this is not good. It's not looking good. We don't know what else to do. We're just going to send you home and ask you to be comfortable. But God, and look at me. I, you know, you can look at me. If you don't know me, you would never know that I'm sick and because I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not looking sick. Why? Because God has kept me. You know, and he's met me at every angle. And and I just cannot imagine my life, especially in this journey, without God. There's no way I'd gamble the fact of not having him in my life because he has been so real. He's been so real, real. Like, you know, the Bible says he sticks closer than a brother. That's the truth. Mm-hmm. And if you're wondering out there, how can that be? How can you give so many props to an invisible God? Well, to me, he's not invisible, you know, and mm-hmm. and he shows up in so many ways. And I think if you don't see him, it's because you're not looking for the evidences of what he does in your daily life. But uh, so I, so all God, my family, and my group of five friends that have been just there. I don't know what I would have done without mm-hmm. them. So you have a stool with three wonderful legs to yes. support you. Absolutely. Um, I know, uh, you know. Personally, and as a pastor, as a counselor, that well-meaning people can say really stupid things. Oh Lord! <laughs> and so I, I want to just, I uh, just want to open that one up. And what are some things that somebody should never say uh, to a cancer person? You listen, I'm laughing to keep myself from just <laughs> wanting to vomit all the things I really want to say, um, because. I'd had this happen to me yesterday. You know, Mm -hmm. I I think I want to give the advice. Well, let me just, let me start with saying some of the things you shouldn't say. Well, sister, bless God. (laughs) You're saved. If he didn't heal you and you die, you're going to go to heaven. You should be happy. When I just told you, God said he's going to heal me. Mm -hmm. You know, or did you look at the Bible? The Bible says that it's streets of gold in heaven. Wouldn't you rather be there than here? Mm -hmm. It's okay. Just go ahead and go on. If you just go ahead and go on, we understand if you don't want to hold on. You know, to me, I'm I'm a fighter by nature. So to me, Mm -hmm. giving up is not an option. So to me, you're wasting your breath saying that to me because Mm -hmm. it'll just really make me not want to answer your phone call the next time you ring my line (laughs) because I don't want to hurt your feelings and say what I really think. But I just think, like yesterday, I, I had a phone call, and this person was saying, well, you know, if if you happen, if God doesn't heal you and you happen to die, it's okay because, see, you held on as long as you could. People don't want to hear that. You know, if you don't know what to say, then shut your mouth and don't say anything. Mm-hmm. Um, or I think that people don't realize it's okay not to know what to say. I'd rather you just call and say, Amy, how are you? I'm thinking about you. I love you. Is there anything I can pray about? Mm-hmm. That is means more to me than you keeping me on the phone for 30 minutes convincing me that it's okay to die. Mm-hmm. You know, that is the dumbest. It goes mm-hmm. against everything the Bible even says mm-hmm. uh, that I've ever heard. Or another one, here's, here's a great one. When they want to preach to you and quote all the healing scriptures, which I know by heart now, um, <laughs> And they want to give you a whole sermon for 30 minutes and tell you, you know, that back in the day, God healed at the pool of Bethesda. <laughs> you know, I know that story. I've read the Bible several times. You know, so I'm thinking, I don't need a whole sermon for you to just end up not saying anything <laughs> that was edifying for my spirit. So I would say to the listeners that sometimes just being there, even in your silence, I've tried to get my friends to understand this, even in your silence. Example, we have coffee, we mm-hmm. have breakfast together, we do ping pong. We don't spend all that time you preaching to me about <laughs> how either I'm going to die no. or live, right? Because that's a waste of time. I know all that stuff. If you're going to have time with me, let it be a time that you're edifying me, I'm blessing you, we're having a good time. And that would sometimes be sitting watching a movie with mm-hmm. me and not even saying a word. 
Sometimes it'd be calling saying, I love you and I'm thinking of you. Sometimes is there anything you want to pray about? But don't tell me how you think it's okay if I go ahead and just let go and die. I'm not ready to die. God already told me I'm not going to die. So quit calling me and telling me anything about death because it's just not going to happen. You're wasting your breath. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the one of the statements that that I uh, and I taught my counseling students this for years is that people will use your illness, in this case, you, to share their story. Every time they, they, they have all this unresolved baggage going on, and let me tell you about the time in my life. So it's at some level you you're going to have to get your antenna up, that is to say your discernment, your understanding, and recognize the, those people because they will uh, come into your life and it's just... It, drain it's, you. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll drain you. So, you know, we're uh, our time is wrapping up here pretty quick, Amy, and uh, I want to uh, I want to pitch this uh, last idea. Uh, I know that uh, I get a lot of different viewers. Uh, my book, Resilient... Tools for Getting Up After Life Knocks You Down. My email is in my book. And I'm starting to get letters now from people. Are, uh, the last show that I shot was just simply called Answers to Questions. And, and in 20 minutes, I went through you know, five questions. And they, some of them were really intense. So I know that there's a variety of people that are that are going to be listening to this. Some of them are going to, uh, in fact, I'll just say this to the uh, audience. You may have a friend or a family member who has cancer right now. Uh, you may have just been diagnosed yourself. Uh, encourage people to listen to this podcast because as you've heard, it's been very practical and very edifying. But having said that, there's going to be uh, a bookend of people listening to this podcast those those people who believe strongly so like yourself those people who are believers but they're kind of going i'm a believer but i'm really angry why, why did i get why did i get this i mean why is a is a very short question that that has a very long answer quite quite frankly and so, uh, I mean, I, I've said to you b before that, you know, why Amy? She's done so much for so many people. And I told her that I'm angry about, about her cancer. Um, so given, given those bookends, uh, the believer to the person who, quite frankly, uh, they don't really have a place for God in their life, uh, put, a, put a bow on this package, if you would, for us. Well, for my personal journey, I, I, I would be dead without God. I know that, you know, and, and the doctors knew it. Um, I, God, to me, is very, very real. Uh, you know, I'll put it to you like this. Have you ever had somebody that you have a lot of history with and you know that you know them? And so you you know that if someone speaks something that's not true of them or if if some rumor starts that you know you'd be like that's not that's not bill he'd mm -hmm. never do that why because you're so confident in what you know of the person well that's how i feel about the lord we i've been serving the lord now 19 years and we have a real good resume together mm -hmm. and i've been through so many things and he's helped me through and so when cancer, when I got diagnosed with two stage four cancers, um, and then I had an obstruction and they said at the emergency room that if I would have been, if I would have been two hours later, I would be, wouldn't be here today doing this interview. Mm -hmm. But I knew God had me. You know, how do you explain that? How do you explain what medical, like the doctor, like doctor, he said, you have it on paper, you have scans, you have, you know, all these x-rays that are saying you're done. But then God says, no, you're not, and you're still here. I'll, I'll just give this example before I wrap it up. Um, I remember that I started the new chemo. Uh, the, I'm, on, I'm apparently the last chemo they can give me, and if this didn't work, nothing is. And it's very potent. And I remember when they gave it to me, I was sleeping 15, 16 hours a day. I couldn't mm. get out of the bed. I couldn't eat. I was <clears throat> crawling to the bathroom, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but I remember still thinking I'm not going to die. The Lord already told me he's going to heal me, so I'm not going to let this get to me, even though I'm feeling the effects thereof. But I'll, I'll never forget thinking to myself, if it wouldn't be for God, God did not do this to me. And I think that's what people ask me all the time. How can God allow, if God is such a good God, why did he allow you, one of his servants, to get sick? But, but the, we live in a fallen world. 
you know, stuff is in our food, you know, things are in the air, you know, all this stuff. It, it could have happened to anyone. I don't believe, and no one can convince me, that God just looked down on the earth and said, oh, let's strike Amy with cancer. She can handle it. I don't believe that. Cancer also runs in my family. Okay. It's generational. My great-grandmother had it. My dad has it. And now I'm dealing with it. You know, there's a lot of other reasons why this could befall on somebody. But but I think we have a hard time um, letting God get off our the hook when things go wrong. But when things go right, we want to bless him. And then we want to blame him if things don't go right. Well, I'm just not like that. Like I told you, I have a resume with God. He's done a lot for me. So I choose to believe what he tells me. He's going to heal me. He loves me. He's a good God. Um, for those of you that just don't understand God, I just challenge you to give him a try. <laughs> Start small because he <clears throat> will always meet you and he will shock you. Now, that doesn't mean I think a lot of the times people think just because we serve God and we love God and we believe in God that everything is going to be perfect. Well, if that's going to be the case, you know, why would we be here in this world? We wouldn't need a God. We wouldn't want to serve a God if everything was great. I think what happens is we just try to find people to blame and try to find reasons to, to justify our anger and our feelings. But I'll just say this. In my life, God is more real than you watching me, more real than Bill sitting here. In my life, it's been that way for me, and I could tell you countless stories. Maybe we'll make a podcast on the miracles <laughs> of God. How about that? With evidences there. <laughs> Wouldn't that be good? Because uh, I know a lot of you like to see it before you believe it. But I will just say this. God is real, and He loves you, and He loves me, and He didn't strike me with cancer. He is he has been holding me together ever since I've been diagnosed and he has kept me when the, going back to when I was diagnosed and the doctor said this is the most potent chemo you'll ever have if this doesn't work he said the cancer is spreading everywhere there's two spots on your chest now I have stage 4 liver and stage 4 colon cancer and I and I took it to God in prayer now in 7 days I took it to God in prayer and I demanded another scan and they're like, Amy, we can't give you that many scans back to back. I said, my insurance is going to pay for it, and you're going to give me another scan. Because God told me that he is going to hold the cancer from spreading, and it's not going to happen. Well, I had another scan. So both of my, I have two cancer doctors. Both of them came into the room, and they said, we want to show you your skin. And they said, we don't understand. Mm. I love that. We don't understand. They said, the the spots in your in your chest are gone, just gone. We don't know where they went. But all the, the cancer now is being pushed back. They said it's almost as if there's a hand holding it back from spreading. And it's just holding it. And now it's squished it all this way. And it's not spreading anymore. And I said, that is not just like a hand. I said, that's the hand of God. I prayed and asked him to stop this thing because it was getting out of control. Now, how do you explain that when the doctor comes with the x-ray and the paper and says, well, I guess we'll just have to believe what you say, Miss Pilgrim, because there is no other explanation. We don't understand it, but we're going to say it has to be God. So all that to say, there's your testimony. This is a real person still living with cancer. I just, I just, my heart just aches for you to give him just one try, mm -hmm. just one try. Start small and he's not going to fail you. He's not. That's the God I serve. And that's the God I want to introduce you to through my testimony. That's what I'd say. You know, it, it's interesting. I'm very aware that this upcoming Sunday is Palm Sunday. You know, and I know that that's going to date the podcast and uh, Easter's coming up. And I'm very aware that Jesus asked three times in the garden, can you take this from me? And Father God did not remove that from him. And then in 2 Corinthians, I think it's 2 Corinthians 12, Paul says, I asked three times of the Lord, can you take this thorn from me? And God says, I'm not going to remove it, but I'm going to give you grace to deal with it. Mm. And I want to give the, uh, the audience just the idea that grace is God's rest after condemnation ends. God's rest after condemnation ends. Last last image for you to think about, and then we're done. Uh, so I'm I'm preaching on Sunday and at my church and city church in Chattanooga, and uh, and in my reading uh, I came upon uh, it's been now eight years that the Passion of the Christ came out, the mm -hmm. Mel Gibson movie, 
And he was asked in an interview, uh, you know, here you are, this famous actor. You've been in all these motion pictures. Uh, you don't even make a cameo appearance in Passion of the Christ. He said, I do. And they said, well, where's your appearance? He said, when they are crucifying Jesus' hand on the cross, that's my hand in the film that they're crucifying. Mm. And he said, I wanted to go on record as saying, I know that I needed to be crucified. That's that's Mel Gibson. Oh, man. And I just thought, wow. So I think that when we think about uh, Palm Sunday and when we think about Easter, uh, we th think about suffering, but we also think about victory. And clearly, that's the word that we want to give you and leave you with today. Be encouraged. God is in control. God bless you. And we'll see you another time.